All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Brian Poole. I'll be uh, I'm delighted here to facilitate our May quarterly meeting for the Rocky Mountain National Park Agricultural Subcommittee. Uh, we do have a busy agenda. I shared this about a week ago. I hope you had a chance to peek at this. Um, we have a lot of folks and guest speakers and topics to cover today. Um, and I'll go, just go ahead and get started. I know there's a couple of folks uh, I'm expecting still to show up here in a few minutes, but let's um, let's let them do so. Uh, just off the top, I have some uh, opening remarks that I wanna make sure I share. Uh, as usual, I'll just do a quick review of our guiding principles. And then I've had two requests for topics right off the top. Uh, one is the possible invitation for NGOs to come to some of our future meetings. And the other is for what might be the, um, the end state for this subcommittee. You know, how will we know when we've succeeded? Uh, what are there future milestones or measures that we can use to gaze our project uh, uh, progress towards such completion? Uh, we just want to have that conversation. I know uh, several folks have asked me, how, how, do, how will we know when we're there? And what is the right way to consider uh, our path and the progress? So I wanna just have an open discussion there and make sure folks have an opportunity to share their views. I don't know that we'll immediately reach a conclusion, uh, of course, but um, I think it's important that we get some ideas on the table and, and maybe we just touch on this every, every meeting or so uh, to get a sense of how people are feeling regarding our progress. Um, ah, thanks, Dan, appreciate that. Uh, as usual, we'll ask you to um, to go ahead and log your name and organization in the chat. That is our uh, um, our attendance, if you will. So go ahead and do that. I'll I'll lead by example here after Dan. Um, Thanks everyone. Those will keep keep coming across the, the line there. Take a look at everybody who's on. I know you can see each other in chat, but this is be the official record for us. So, um, all right, well, let's, let's dive in. I just wanna remind everyone of, of our guiding principles. I won't read all this, but I think certainly the first few, um, maybe one or two minutes, you can just remind ourselves of why we're here. Paramount here, the first paragraph in terms of trying to reduce our wet deposition of nitrogen at the park by, uh, by 50%. Other key elements here is our continued commitment to voluntary collaboration across Colorado and the agricultural community and other agencies. And continue to evaluate and optimize our science guided best management practice, our BMPs. And we'll be digging into those today again and ultimately promote the prevention, uh, promote the implementation of those effective BMPs. Some of those include the early warning system, which we'll be touching on briefly today. Okay, just a reminder why we're all here and why this meeting is so important and critical to the future of Rocky Mountain National Park and uh, all of our stakeholders. So uh, let's open up with the first discussion point here. Uh, we've had the, some offline conversations with some parties here regarding uh, the possible invitation of NGOs uh, to future meetings. I'll just open this up. If anybody has an initial thought on this, uh, please let us know and we can uh, continue to, to work towards a conclusion on that. And Brian, if, uh, um... If I could, I, you know, it, it's something that the, the involvement of these NGOs and, you know, it, who we're talking about is um, like EDF and Colorado Trout Unlimited, who are actually uh, started this project because of NGO involvement. Um, and so they used to come to meetings uh, there 
for whatever reason, time had um, to do so had uh, waned in recent years. Um, there is, and part of the reason this came up was because the recent outreach from about the uh, addendum to remove the contingency plan, which is another, the next agenda item here. Um, but the, there is there was a uh, sense, and the agencies do believe that um, that continued NGO or involvement of these nonprofits is is beneficial to this project, um, one for their own interests and for own for um, you know providing uh, suggestions and and um, you know be, being. Um, at, in some cases, acting as 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 advocates for us when we want to move things forward. Um, so you know, pre previously it was it was um, you know safe, if you will, appropriate <laughs> to have them at the meeting. I think the reason that we're we're asking this the, this question is because they they haven't been present for uh, for a number of uh, years now, and mm -hmm. so there is there's interest to do so. Not to say that they would be at every meeting, but period like uh, periodically, they may even have information to uh, to present or suggest for us. So that is uh, I don't, that's just what I'm compelled to say right now, reflecting on that history and that um, you know agency suggestion that we um, allow them back in the fold. Yeah, and, I, and I'm Dave Hoisler. I represent Trava Limited. Uh, oh yeah, podcasters. So glad to be here. Hopefully, we can continue to add value. Other feedback? I guess just a clarifying question. So we never disinvited them, correct? It just folks kind of lost mm -hmm. interest and stopped engaging with the with the process. Um, because I've been part of this for nine going on 10 years now through the health department and in here. And I don't know that I've ever been at a meeting where the NGOs were present. And I just I don't think we ever asked that they not come. It was more just that folks stopped engaging. I, th I think that's right, Bonnie. I'll just jump in as well. I, I remember um, their engagement early on and and for some time, at least environmental defense. Um, and I agree, we never stopped them, not never stopped asking them to come. I guess my question is twofold and I'll just be direct. I guess, what is our goal? And Jim, you talked about some of that. You see them as an advocate to move things forward. And as an ag producer, I guess I can read that two ways, an advocate that can help us move things forward or the um, MOUs see it as an ally to twist the arm of ag. And I guess, so I, I guess when you say an advocate to help move things forward, which do you see it as? Just straight up answer that, please. And then two, I guess my other thought with, with inviting them to engage again, <clears throat> I'm, I'm good with that. Um, but I think there'll probably be a lot of catch up to do. And I think a lot of that catch up needs to take place offline so that these meetings don't get bogged down with trying to catch folks up that haven't been involved the last few years um, because right, right. we've had that happen before. So those are my only couple of thoughts. I guess I'd like like an MOU response as to, to what you mean by advocate. Yeah, it, so it, it's, um th those are all uh, valid thoughts, uh, Justin, you know, and just, the evidence from our outreach during the contingency plan addendum thing was that there uh, there's was, there was quite a lot of in, interested in, in interest in opportunities for for additional NOx regulation um, and and room for that. I mean NOx is heavily regulated, but um, there's uh, there's there's room to do more. And so I, I think their participation. I mean, it's not not only just ag meetings. By the way, they they um, may tap into some MLU agency meetings. Um, their participation would increase understanding of the ongoing work on this project, um, and would I think better help their engagement when there is a chance to uh, to advocate um, Knox regulations. And, and and sure, I mean it's it's uh, keeping an eye on the strategy and implementation with. With agriculture could um, um, could be uh, part of it, but I mean I, I don't I don't think that any of that is new. I mean we have I we collectively have eyes on us uh, anyway from the uh, Air Quality Control Commission. Um, so th those are 
I guess I, I guess those are just some thoughts in brief in response to your um, concerns. If I could uh, make a little comment here, so uh, and this is the our bad at uh, Toronto Limited, uh, uh, our chapter that I had been associated with uh, uh, the Rocky Mountain National Park up in Estes Park uh, has been dechartered, and so uh, through lack of uh, participation, lack of uh, uh, you know really doing a lot of work. So they moved it to the Rocky Mountain Flycasters, which is, you know, well, Larimer and uh, uh, Jackson County covering uh, the drainages of the North Platte, the, the Pooter and the Big Thompson. So this fell within us now. And our real uh, charter and mandate is to advocate for cold water uh, fisheries and then, and then look at what has an impact upon that and try to work with the agencies to minimize any impacts. And we uh, work with uh, at the state level with ag very, very well through our bull moose committee, our advisory uh, committee at the state level. So we've we thought this was a good uh, kind of tie into all of that and just staying on top of it and knowing where we can help. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, thank you for voice. That. I, I guess the, the the other thing that I would add is in terms of, say, NGO understanding, I mean, I, agriculture, in my observation, the subcommittee and the BMP strategy and so forth is, I think it's, you know, with, with Brian's help, it's um, Bonnie and others have, um, it, it seems to be like the most organized and sort of proactive that feeling at, at, at least and working to, um, you know, work to, to answer those questions of what should be done, what is being done, where should it be done? And then ultimately have BMPs been, uh, been, um, been optimized, a word that appears in the guiding principles. And so if NGOs and others have um, greater touch points and understanding of, you know, agriculture's good work, for example, that, that, can, um, uh, that can help when they are commenting and speaking to others about this project, include, you know, including possibly the commission, for example. So just, just putting some things together of um, how I think it might be beneficial to us. Thanks, Jim. Unless there's an objection, then I think I think we agreeing that you know we we did not uninvite anyone, and we want to continue some of that outreach. We know it's voluntary, of course. Um, so I will uh, I'll note in this that we'll uh, make a note to extend those invitations. We this is a working group, and we want to stay positive and focused on the mission, um, and make sure that folks are comfortable in sharing some of the uh, you know the different discussions, some of which bear fruit, and others are uh, research that's far off. So I'll. Uh, I'll proceed with that unless there's another comment. Uh, Josh. Yeah, Brian, I did have a, another comment and maybe more just a, a perspective from, from some of the things that we've run into. Um, you know, we we have run various stakeholder processes that that EDF and others have been involved in. And and at times those have gotten bogged down because there is a a lack of agreement on on what optimization may mean or what the best path forward is, and and so I I would agree that the the invitation you know should be extended, but I, I do think that you know if there is additional participation in the future, that we probably need to make sure it's structured um, so that we right. don't get completely off topic, off track of of what we're trying to accomplish. And and while leaving space for those conversations, but but not necessarily letting letting those conversations dictate the the path forward, because I think you know there there is a lot of expertise in this room. There are different perspectives that these other groups can can bring, and and all that is valuable. But at the end of the day, I mean, we want to continue to keep moving forward on figuring out what the most productive strategies are, what the best um, use of or documentation of those strategies are so that we can point to that as improvements towards the overall deposition in the park. Right. Well said, Josh. Yeah, and that'll be partly my role to structure the agenda, make sure we're positive and focused, uh, that we're easy on each other uh, and tough on the problems you face. Um, Bonnie? Uh, yeah, just wanted to and extend a welcome to Dave um, from Rocky Mountain Trout, and um, I think this group does a lot of hard work, so, you know, I'm 
always looking for opportunities to showcase that and to have people kind of see, you know, the extent that this group goes to. So happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Well said. All right. Um, of course, feel free to share other comments in the chat and so on, and we'll continue to visit this as we move forward. But I think we've we've got an answer for the moment. Let, let's move on. We're a little behind the schedule, but I do want to touch on um, this idea of a possible a potential end state. And it may not be something that we can tackle this meeting, but I want to raise this and, and touch on it essentially uh, maybe in the next one as well. Um, you know, what what are uh, some ideas that folks have in terms of the end state for the subcommittee? What um, what has been communicated in the past? You know, obviously we have uh, some of the, the great work that Jim has shared. And Jim, I'm, I'm sure you got some thoughts on this, but um, in terms of the glide path and other other language that has been used, uh, it might just be worth re refreshing folks on that and um, and how this committee again can be productive to that end. I want to make sure our time is is useful and and, uh, and helpful to that end. Sorry, right, calling me out then. Yeah, if you like, yeah, I don't oh, I know yeah, you perfect, have perfect. On it, so, um, yeah. so it, yeah, I mean, just some of the related nuts and bolts of the project. Re reminder, of course, the you know, our glide path um, went from 2006 and it extends to 2032. Um, so there's there's that metric. Um, mind you, I, I think those aware of the dynamics are probably probably would guess, and I would suspect that we while um reductions may be achieved we may not uh hit that specific it's possible we don't hit that specific uh, um, target of 1.5 by 2032 um I, I think in advance of those the of 2032 and maybe by the time i'm uh after i'm retired <laughs> um the uh that there'll be an assessment done by by the agencies on how then to what what is what does the future look like uh likely extending the um you know the mou agency work beyond 2032 i mean these these are just ideas that i'm that i'm throwing out there i mean i i think from the agency standpoint this will be an ongoing um ongoing project beyond 2032 yet we still have that target and of course agriculture our uh, collaboration with agriculture is is critical um and so i would i would hope and think that our i i think the work would uh, continue with agriculture related to that is our strategy with agriculture and i mean really answering the question of like the, the end goal is is this word the concept of um bmp optimization which is in the which is in the um the guiding principles now there's there's a lot to that and building up to that is the is the ongoing work of you know what what should be done that's the list of bmps and of course whatever technologies ideas um methods and such will be continuing to refine that list over time um sorry if i said what should be done is the is the, the list of uh, recommended bmps what is being done of course is the surveys which um would which i think um there's plans for periodic assessment of that and then where should it be done currently the the two focus area counties um so that so i i i guess the take home from this is that there to to some degree um i would foresee you know there we we have our target in 2032 yet yet i think it'll it will um take some reassessment and ongoing work to um to continue to steward um, Rocky Mountain National Park resources. I mean, essentially in uh, in perpetuity. Um, now the work, you know, the work of agencies and the group will uh, could be redefined um, upon reassessment in the future. So those are just some thoughts I throw out there. Thank you, Jim. I think that frames up the the long term potential here. Other reaction from, from uh, members. Okay, um, I just like, oh, yeah, go ahead. Brian, I would just say, I think when we went into this, Ag went into it with the goal in mind of solving the problem and fixing it and then being done with it. I don't think any of us planned for this to go on in perpetuity. Now, it, it may it may be that as it as it may, the way it's worked out, 
I think that as we reach our end goal on the glide path, um, I think we need to to discuss sunsetting this. I mean, we um, we're not there yet, so I don't think I think this is a premature discussion to have. But I think as we reach that goal, I think that uh, once we've met our goal, meeting for the sake of meeting to make everybody feel good, we're all busy enough as it is. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly what I, I want to uh, to start to evaluate as we move through. We know we've got um, some measures and milestones that Jim indicated, and we'll continue to gauge our progress. Um, but I, I think it's worth all of us saying, you know, how much progress are you making? What can this group do? What's what is working? Um, and be uh, be thoughtful about that. So that's my goal. Uh, I would also say that I think. Um, one of the things this group does that's very important is the continued attempt to understand this, you know, this complex atmospheric chemistry that we have going on and, and looking at what is possible, what isn't, um, and really having furthering our understanding at every single meeting of just how everything works together. Because I think one of the things I've found is just that it's this situation is a lot more complicated um, than it appeared on its face and figuring out how to make the right changes um, is very difficult and it, it very much depends on all kinds of different things. So I think that continued um, just understanding, researching, and, and really trying to get to the bottom of how things work and what can and can't be done is also an important component of what this group does. Thanks, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. Hi, can I jump in here? This is Corin from Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, one thing that would help me is maybe in a future meeting or meetings, um, we could spend a little time on what um, sort of innovations and best practices have been made um, and like sh sharing that out. Um, that would really help me to be able to then share that with others um, in terms of you know, what best practices are new, what best practices are now, um, just everybody does them, um, you know, kind of like laying that out every once in a while um, for us in this group would be very helpful. Thanks, Corin. We uh, we have that on the agenda for today. In fact, Bonnie's smiling, mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> so oh, okay. We'll give you a, a nice taste of that uh, here in about, in about uh, 45 minutes, I think. Something Excellent. Like Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, let's shift to our uh, regular agenda here for now. Of course, we can come back if there's time and talk about some of these other things as well. Uh, Jim, do you want to give us a quick update on the uh, contingency plan? Sure thing. Uh, so, yeah, this is, uh, you know, the addendum to, to re remove the contingency plan, I think is familiar to this group. Um, and just uh, just to give a couple of summary bullets as we're working to uh, to conclude this uh, this item, we did we have the agencies did conduct outreach about uh, on on the addendum, including with agriculture since uh, like September of, of last year. So there's been there's been multiple touches with uh, with agriculture, Colorado Trout Unlimited, Environmental Defense Fund, and NPCA, and so. Um, we we have arrived at what we and and we, we appreciate very much appreciate ag's time and discussion and uh, critique and you know making uh, making the addendum better um and so we have arrived at what it, what at least the uh, agency staff believed to be the final text we were working with uh leadership to uh to achieve that as well and expect what i the, the rough timeline i expect to achieve that say by mid the middle of this month, um, and uh, you know, unless unless other um, things are thrown at us, and then to continue or to then to start the circulation for agency signatures, and that is um, those the signatures on this is the same thing as the as our uh, the MOU and master plan. It's the park superintendent, um, the regional director of the park service, and then the leads of CDPHE and um, EPA Region Eight. Um, so again, appreciate Ag's time. I'm, I'm seeing Bonnie on there. Bonnie's the feedback was uh, was great and um, helping us ensure that, like the the um, 
uh, legal considerations, for for example, were articulated well in the in the agenda in the addendum. But what what was encouraging in the end, I think it was at our what February meeting was um, that was voiced in front of the group. Um, I forget who said this, but there was uh, makes a lot of sense and like the way it's written uh, comments in, in front of the group. So um, and having having overcome uh, prior and, and addressed prior comments through dialogue and both and uh, directly in in the agenda, uh, excuse me, in the addendum. <laughs> um, so that's that's my up, update in brief and just the, the, the final steps once we um, you know achieve agency, um, we get all the signatures by say the end of this month or um, beginning of June, it will be the addendum signed final addendum will be posted to the uh, CDPH, the CDPHE's um, website, and then um, we'll you know, acknowledge that point and its presence at the next meeting with agriculture. Um, so I don't know if you have final language to share with this group. Um, we, you, I had some back and forth, and um, my understanding at the time was that that uh, you know kind of the adjustments would go out to the broader group as a whole for discussion and then that has not happened yet and I you know asked a couple times about that um because I don't want to be the only person weighing in on it so I also definitely want everybody else in this group to get the chance to put eyes on that finalized language um in case folks have comments on it so um and I also haven't seen you know I saw the last iteration but still had some suggestions so I don't know what's been included and what hasn't so it'd be helpful if we saw what was presented at the last meeting and then what you guys consider it sounds like you guys have finalized it possibly well i don't want to wait out of want to lay waylay this meeting what's our what's our time or eleven thirty two? 32 uh I, I mean is is it okay brian if i uh i mean cut me off if we if necessary but this is the um am i sure yeah, let's go time? ahead we we have uh, another uh what is it, eight minutes or so until we, we go to Megan. So, and if you can cover Christy's piece as well in that time, we're on track. Is And let me just check, is Christy on the call? Yes, I'm here, Jim. Okay. Um, my waylay is a uh, second here, but I'm I'm also trying to, to uh, share my screen. Christy, you think you can cover what you got in like five minutes or so? Yes, for sure. Okay. Go ahead, Jim. Um, And I would also say I think this is important enough to to go over it. Um, yeah. You know, especially if we're very close to finalizing it. So I would rather take the time and um, give folks the opportunity to see where we're at. I agree, um, Bonnie. Since we'll we'll, we'll last, stick to it. I was it one of the few, at least beef participants. We were out in New Orleans, and um, so I want other folks to have a chance to to give their feedback. It, I'd like to have as many eyes on it as we can and hear other folks' ideas. So thank you. It is my screen shared, Ryan? Yep, you're good. And, and, and so this was the uh, this is the language. And and is Megan on the call? Yeah, I'm here, Tom. Is is that something that you could speak to real quickly, just to, for the legal considerations piece and what changes were made to address Bonnie's comments? Um, off the top of my head, not necessarily. I think Rebe is Rebecca um, kind of had this language reviewed by their legal team. Um, we streamlined it based on Bonnie's comments and added uh, some basic language, including kind of separately under Colorado law to make sure that that was really clear, um, that that was separate as well as, um, let's see. I think we tried to just like simplify the descriptions of each of the pieces to make it it a lot more clear that they are distinct from one another as far as what the exemption is under Colorado, Colorado law versus um, the Federal Clean Air Act with, with ammonia. And um, I'd have to look back at exactly what Bonnie's comments were in, in preparation for describing how exactly we incorporated them. But um if is Rebecca on the call as well hi uh, this is Matt uh, Matt Lang with EPA um no Rebecca's yeah. not on and yeah I, I think you characterized it accurately we tried to just um you know make clear uh, like 
federal clean air act requirements still apply and i think that was partly some of the feedback that we had gotten to to clarify that so we we tried to do that here so this is justin <clears throat> one of the the feedbacks we had given is um uh, under legal consideration where there's a bit of a space there in this then that it's not really a paragraph, but the non-attainment areas in Colorado, starting there. As you read down through that, in about the third line down, it talks about facilities and sources um, that these requirements, oh, okay, let me find it. Where it calls out <clears throat> facility sources and categories of sources specifically, agriculture, horticulture, floriculture, our, our comments surrounded the fact that the way this is written makes it sound that those are the only types of facilities that are exempt when in reality all facilities are exempt from anything beyond federal clean air act standards what do you mean all facilities Bonnie, can you speak to this some? So I think it, it went back to, and I think it's been um, adjusted, but that um, the implication previously was that we were the only ones exempt from ammonia emissions regulations yes, when it, it's not being regulated um, at any level. And I do think this does match the language that I last sent. And so I think I think that has been addressed. And it was more specifically, the, it really made it sound like we were exempt from ammonia emissions regulations that didn't exist. Um, and I think that's what what Justin was touching on. And yes, so, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. It's it's hard to tell looking at this without having the other up in front of us to to compare to. Yeah, you know, and I think it would be helpful to make, for folks to see that. Um, not necessarily right now, but maybe right after the meeting. Um, so if they've got any um, additional comments, and then we also had a bullet point that we um, had suggested removing. And I just wanted to see if that was taken out. I couldn't remember. I've mostly just seen the legal language and not the rest of the document. Do you remember what section that was in, Bonnie? Oh, I tested my, I, I should be able to get, it was, I believe, under the rationale for a contingency plan removal. So, um, And it looks like that language has, let's see. It looks like that language has changed since we last discussed it. So it's quite a bit. And is it your from, what I'm, from what I'm looking at? So the last time we saw this document, the bullet points are, are different. I, it would take a while for me to parse that out. Okay. Looking at looking at the red line that you sent that I think you're referring to under under the rationale for contingency plan removal, you had redlined out. There was a fourth bullet point there that said triggering the CP would be inconsistent with agriculture's longstanding voluntary particip to pr participation in the project and their industry's exemption from ammonia emission regulation. And yeah, you wanted right. to strike that last piece in line with you know what what we've discussed right yeah. now. Um, and and I, I think that that absolutely has been been taken out. Um, yeah, it looks like that's now the third bullet point, and then there's mention of this group, um, which is great. So, but it does also look like there's uh, uh, some other changes that have been made to this. <laughs> so, I'm sure they're you know. It's right, right, but but you're but I guess for the purpose of our exchange, it, it I guess my assessment is that maybe your 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 comment has been addressed here and and the concern there's no longer a concern for the third that third bullet that does mention agriculture that is correct okay. but there are new bullet points now and that i haven't had the opportunity to read so uh, yeah. but yes that that has been um that change has been made and i appreciate that so thank you well, so, how about this? If if we send it, uh, you know, for, maybe for the purpose of keep uh, purpose of keeping things uh, moving, I mean, we can talk about a, a couple other. Uh, let's let's send it out. Uh, the agencies are also, you know, doing a last round of uh, um, uh, language checks. If we send it out, either, you know, right now or at the end of this movie, uh, this this meeting rather, through uh, uh, Brian. Um, 
can we get some, it, it, you could take a quick look at the language. It's, it's, this is what, two and a half pages um, and say, get comments to us by Monday, the 8th. I think that's totally appropriate. And, and I'll go back to the very first call that, that you, Jim, had with uh, Ag when you reached out to us and said, hey, would we be interested in, in supporting removal from this contingency plan? We hadn't seen anything that was written up. And that was one thing that, that we made very clear is we're happy to support something, but we want to see what gets written up first. And you guys shared that with us for comments. But then again, to to put a final out without Ag taking a look at it and saying, hey, this has everybody's support when we haven't seen the final. Yeah, and, so, and so we, we are absolutely uh, interested and willing to um, make ensure that there is a uh, final check. And um, we, we had, you know, uh, uh, to, uh, I guess, to give you assurance that we've addressed your concern. So I, I think I think sharing it comments by Monday can uh, can be uh, accommodated, and we'll again work to do that through uh, through Brian. Um, that works, Jim. Thank what, you. Was was there anything else just for the good of the well, like behind here now? But um, anything else quick, or is that it can can we just can we leave that as the plan forward? I think that sounds good. Um, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and, and then uh, do we have time? Uh, Christy's here to give a. Yeah, I'd like to make sure Christy up. gets uh, some time. We'll we'll work this through. Yep. Hey, I'll just take a, a quick two minutes. Hey, everybody. Um, the uh, the report we're working on right now is the 2021 data report. Um, we have the model data substitution done for the glide path. We're waiting on uh, the trends analysis to be completed to be able to write that data up. We also um, really need to look into um, why deposition was high in 2021. So we were planning on doing our, our usual, you know, looking at the meteorology um, uh, and, and trying to, to figure out some of those bounds. Um, our office has been really waylaid by a bunch of um, budget exercises. So our budget, as, as, as with a lot of our other federal partners, um, has remained flat. And of course, with inflation um, and salaries all going up, um, we're looking at like a 35% drop in spending power. Um, so uh, we've been evaluating each of our air quality networks. <clears throat> which includes the NADP sites, but also um, four or five other air quality monitoring networks that we also manage. Um, so I've been looking for partners um, in funding um, and happy to say that um, CDPHE is going to be picking up the complete cost for the um, uh, NADP site CO22, which is Pawnee, um, so out in the grasslands. So uh, thanks to Josh Korth for, for working that through the system. Um, every little bit helps. Um, EPA last year um, had to shut down um, the Sugarloaf site, which is uh, the lower elevation site near Niwot Ridge. Um, we were able to come to the rescue for that site and keep that site running through the year. But now uh, that site has ranked very low because it's not in a national park. So I am currently mm -hmm. looking for funders for that site. Um, and then there's also um, some updates on Lock Bale, which I think I'm going to have Corin speak to. Um, and I see Jill is on here too, if, if you want to add a few words. So that's it for me. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Okay, I guess I'll, I will jump in. This is Corin again. So um, Lock Vale is, um, we're looking over the next uh, six years that there's going to be a transition. It's what's going on with the long-term monitoring and research program. Um, you know, I've been talking with Jill Barron, who through USGS um, is the site manager and collects the samples and sends them to NADP. And they um, anticipate funding through the end of fiscal year 24 to continue taking those, um, collecting the NADP samples from the Lockville site. 
So we are already um, in meetings and brainstorming how to continue that site after that time. Um, we just had a meeting with Jill and some of her leadership from the Fort Collins Science Center for USGS and also leadership from the National Park Service. So we are brainstorming through that, but the fact is we are gonna have to find some funding for that um, most likely. And we're also talking with USGS over about what their plans are for longer term in terms of that research site. Um, and I guess I'll let Jill kind of speak to that if you want, Jill. Um, but I just wanted to let people know that there are some potential changes in store and we are engaging on um, figuring out how to continue that site. Yeah, I'm happy to talk briefly. I don't know how much time was allocated for this discussion. It's not what I had intended to talk mm -hmm. about. Um, <laughs> I, Lockville Watershed, of course, has been uh, the type locality, the location for measuring all the atmospheric deposition, as well as a lot of the ecological effects since 1983. And um, I have funded that out of my own research budget since that time. Um, the USGS has been the funding source since 1994. And uh, you all know I was going to eventually retire. I've been mentioning this for a long time. I have set myself a six-year glide path to that. But what that means is pivoting away from the field data collection in order to fund some postdoctoral fellows whom I hope will help me analyze all of the data we never have analyzed to date. So I'm excited about the scientific exploration that's about to occur, but at, what it does is it sets up a time period um, by which we want to continue NADP sampling, of course, at least through 2032, and ecological effects work because we continually are surprised. And, and um, we have a little bit of time to think about that, but we need to find the funding. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Joel. That was great. Really good, um, really good brief. Questions for Christy or Jill or Corin on uh, on all this, or offers for funding. <laughs> <laughs> we never say no to funding. Right, right. <laughs> I will also add real quick. I'm I'm multitasking this week. I'm at the NADP meeting in Madison, Wisconsin, and. Um, and Aaron Pina, who uh, many of you uh, will remember, who was integral to the early warning system um, development with Russ Schumark Schumacher, has taken a job with the US Forest Service and is now the uh, Forest Service rep to NADP. So it's a small world out there. Um, and I look forward to working with Aaron more closely in the future. I told him I'd give him, give him an update on his, his uh, pet project, so. <laughs> ah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Megan. Thanks, Brian. So this is a quick update. Um, not a ton of movement since since we last talked. The, I've requested the Air Quality Control Commission put the briefing and update for this project on the calendar again for October. So I'm waiting to hear back from them. But as of um, my review of the long-term calendar, it looks like that probably won't be an issue. So tentatively, folks can plan on that happening at uh, the third Thursday of the October month. But I will send uh, confirmation when that formally gets on the calendar. Um, and at, once that gets on the calendar, I do think you know the months leading up to it, it's it's going to be essential to to plan out not just moving forward with um, the typical update what we that we give, but really um, pinpointing a, a participant or two from from this group um, to at, you know just advocate for and complement the efforts that are made that have been made um, by the agricultural group. So I think that that that's something that we're really still interested in and. Um, definitely want to see come to fruition from the the presentation to the commission on October 
And so kind of making it more of a joint presentation between the MOU agencies and the Ag Subcommittee for the mm -hmm. agricultural piece um, is, is absolutely essential. I, I still feel that. And I know that the commission is very much open to that as well. Um, yeah. So just keeping this discussion open as, as things get more solidified, um, I don't think we're going to necessarily have an interim meeting at any point to provide an update to the commission. Their, their calendar is so, so crammed right now um, before October. I don't think that even if we wanted to, we could, but um, I think maybe requesting a bit of additional time based on what we've had on the past in October to allow for some agricultural participation is going to be really key. So I've communicated that to the commission administration and we'll keep the group updated as that continues to evolve. So any any right. questions specifically on that um, or 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 thoughts or heartburn issues that um, related to that idea? Uh, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I think we are very committed to having a representative there. I will say I still think we haven't nailed that down, but I think we can commit to having somebody selected at least by the next quarterly meeting. And if we get that done sooner, I'm sure we'll, we can just commu start communicating with you guys on who we'd like to, who we think we'll have at the AQCC meeting. But I think we're committed to having one or two ag representatives there. So perfect. Thanks, Bonnie. And so Great that's what we are. We're going to meet again in August. Is that right? For the quarterly meeting for this, yes, yeah, yeah, it'll be the first okay. Thursday, the first Thursday in August, uh, same time as today. Yep. And then um, for the October meeting, if if we're able to get it on the calendar, then which I hope, um, the their like the presentation will be due to the commission in advance of that, and probably starting to wrap that up and have our approach really solidified by the end of September. So I think that leaves us enough time. I don't think it will be too big of a lift, but definitely wanna set up some meetings with that individual um, to, to kind of propose what that additional um, sharing will look like and what that role will be and how it will all flow. So I think we have plenty of time and I'm happy to hear that, that you all are still in support of that approach. So thanks. Yeah, thanks Megan, great update. Um, just real quick before we move on, Megan, can you um, tell the group about your role changing a little bit? I remember this being discussed in February, but a lot of folks weren't here. And so I can yeah. the details and it looks like we've got somebody new um, from air. So just if you could touch on that real quick, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if Josh, I got on a little late today, so I'm not sure if he had a chance to introduce himself. It's it's. I, I wouldn't call it necessarily more of a change in my role, but it, an a additional support um, for CDPHE with this project. I, I'm, I'm technically on the the client within the the air climate program, so a lot of my work is both focused on climate rule makings, um, and is kind of shifting a bit away from um, things like regional haze and and and. Um, Knox regulations and stuff that's a, a, a little bit more tied to this project. And um, Josh, I'd, I'd love it if you would introduce yourself if you're still on. And um, he's he's part of the the planning and policy program, more somewhat more in the role of what Lisa DeVore, who for those of you that remember, um, had taken within the division. So especially with the milestone year coming up, I think that's really where I've asked for some additional support, getting the milestone report together um, and just making sure that um, we're also, you know, tying tying the the efforts that are also being made within AIR and the planning and policy program into this project appropriately. Um, and Josh has expertise in all of those areas. So I'll, I'll stop and, and let him introduce himself. Um, and and so yeah, that's it. Not so much of a role change for me, but just requesting additional support and additional expertise, especially with the milestone report um, and the lift that that takes coming up. So, yeah, thanks, Megan. I appreciate that. And and um, for those of you who haven't met me before, uh, my name is Josh Korth. I've been with the division a little over three and a half years now. Um, I originally started in the climate change unit, and and Megan and I have kind of swapped roles a little bit. I'm. I'm now a supervisor in the planning and policy group, um, and my two teams really are focused on a lot of the NOx planning um, for both ozone uh, requirements as well as regional haze. Um, our team or our teams also are going to be the ones responsible for any um, additional particulate planning out of the new particulate NACs that are coming up, as well as 
um, various things that may happen with, with transportation or with the utility sector. And so um, it made a lot of sense in, in our mind to, to have more representation from, from planning and policy and, and a little bit higher up the management chain um, for this project. Um, obviously, this is a, a, a very critical uh, project to our Air Commission, to, to our organization, and, and we felt like it, it needed more resources than, than what Megan was able to devote to it with, with all of her uh, role changes and, and her climate change planning work that she's doing. And so um, in the near term, you know, Megan and I will, will tag team this, especially with the milestone report coming up. Um, and then we'll kind of reassess kind of who our primary uh, representative is going forward and, and likely still have a, a team that supports this project um, as it continues to evolve and continues to move forward. So happy to meet all of you. Um, Christy, I'm jealous that you're in Madison right now. That's where I grew up. And um, so so go have some Babcock Hall ice cream for me and, and grab a beer at the Great Dane if you get a chance. Been there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And I just want to say thanks so much to Josh. Um, having additional support from from the the agency is and from him is is just a huge um, huge boon to the project, I think, and will continue to be moving forward. So um, thanks for being part of this. Absolutely. Yep. Thanks, Josh. Welcome. Uh, all right, uh, I've been looking for uh, Russ, Dr. Schumacher, and I don't see him on right now. So uh, he, I know he was traveling and he was gonna try to pull over. He's on, going to some kind of award ceremony. So maybe between when he gets his trophy, uh, he can pop on. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what's happening. Uh, hey, but maybe hey, Brian, we can- Brian, I just wanna mention, um, oh. the addendum is in the chat for anyone yes. that's meeting to grab, but if you could grab it specifically and then send it out to the larger group, Yep. Uh, that would fulfill the the review thing by by Monday. Yep, I'll do that right after the meeting. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you. Yeah. And Brian, I have one more update that I forgot to mention. Go ahead. It's quick. So um, people may have seen the announcement, but uh, the park superintendent, Darla Seidels, is going to be retiring at the end of June. Uh, we anticipate having a pretty short period. Um, and then getting a new superintendent pretty quickly. So just wanted people to know about that change at the at Rocky. Yeah. Thanks, Corin. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just gonna do a quick scan. Russ, are you out there? I don't think he is. Okay, let's move on. I uh I emailed him. We if we can get him on, we will uh we'll break in and just give him a quick update. Um, Jill, you want to tell us about how marmots uh, do not drink coffee? Uh, sure. This is also going to be very brief because I gave a presentation some time ago, at least a year and a half ago, on, on our preliminary data. And if you recall, well, you won't recall, but this paper came out um, as a result of, of, of two things we wanted to do. One is we have been continually trying to leave no stone unturned in looking at contributions of nitrogen to Lock Vale. So, it, so um, the Ag Subcommittee had a lot to do with deciding to do this study um, in order to quantify what other sources besides agricultural emissions could be contributing to the nitrogen that we measure in Lock Vale. And the other was we, um, especially during COVID, noted a ton of people increasing visitation to Lock Vale watershed. And that's been going on for some time. So I gave quite a bit of um, background on this before. I'm happy to um, answer a few questions afterwards. But the paper came out last week. It's authored by um, a number of Park Service people, including Corin, who's on the phone on the line here today, and Scott Esser, and several of my students, and a student intern that we had. And what we did is we did a study of we tried to quantify the input of human urine to the nitrogen budget of Lockvale Watershed in Rocky Mountain National Park, just how much was it contributing? So we had trail counters up, we um, measured soils, we measured surface water, and in order to distinguish uh, human urine from any other source of nitrogen, including animals, we measured caffeine as a marker. So that's what the little clever title is all about, Marmots Don't Drink the Coffee, 
but but humans do. And where we found caffeine and where we found nitrate, we used it as aha, this has to be a source from humans coming in. Um, I highlighted a couple of, and I believe um, Brian sent out the, the, a copy of the manuscript so you can all take a look at it. It turned out to be way fun to do this study. It was certainly an aside from what we normally do, which is climate change, nitrogen deposition interactions. But um, I'm gonna read you just a little bit from the abstract, which is salient to what we're talking about. Um, we quantified all this urine. We did it over a couple of years. The resulting input from urine in Lockville for the summer months of June through September was 0 0.02 kilograms nitrogen per hectare. And when we prorated that to a full year, and we described that in the paper, um, the potential contribution in 2019, so pre-COVID, was 0 0.06 kilograms nitrogen per hectare per year, per year. We compared these to NADP values. Um, the annual measured 2019 deposition was 2.5 kilograms of NR per hectare, nit reactive nitrogen per hectare per year, compared with 0 0.06 from human urine. Um, it indicated a contribution of 2% of, of from human urine to the total waters of Lockvale from, from these visitors coming in and, and, and doing their business. So most of this, um, most of the nitrogen that we measure in Lockvale is still coming from atmospheric deposition, but we argue that 2% isn't insignificant. And it points out that, that um, we've documented an ecological disturbance, a huge ecological disturbance from unprecedented levels of human activity. And the paper sent us on a different tangent. And if uh, the person from Trout Unlimited is still listening, this is important. What it, what it told us is that even though people are, are told about leave no trace guidelines when they travel into the backcountry in the wilderness, they're not following them necessarily. And even so, leave no trace guidelines say nothing, zero, about human urine. They all talk about solid waste. So I'll stop there. That's what the paper was about. I go into a long discussion later in the paper about how this relates to the increase in, in reactive nitrogen worldwide over time. But if you want to read it, I'd be happy to hear your thoughts. That's it. Any questions for uh, about marmots? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Dr. Barron, I, I would like to say thank you. I, I appreciate that that you're trying to overturn every stone looking at, at potential sources. Um, as, as ag producers, we appreciate that. Um, I'm also pretty blown away that it was 2%. I mean, that yes, it's yeah. just 2%, but I never would have guessed that, you know, hikers or backcountry people that would have, have that kind of contribution. I figured it would be lost in the rounding. So that's kind of interesting. Thank it you. Is, and not only is it is it nitrogen, which is what we're interested in, but we worked, um, there's there's another scientist who's been working in Rocky Mountain National Park for a few years, and she's been documenting what else comes out of human body secretions. And it's it's by antibiotic resistant microbes. There's all kinds of, of personal care products, um, uh, pharmaceuticals, they're all found in the waters and the soils, pretty much everywhere she's been looking at. And primarily their highest concentrations or where you have the highest numbers of visitors. So it's a pretty sobering picture about um, loving our national parks maybe more than they should be. Well, and I'll jump in here to say that the park we've been, we have been doing a lot of visitor use impact monitoring. This is not our only project. And it's, um, it is related to, we're doing a day use visitor access strategy planning process right now. So uh, the visitor use is very high. Do keep in mind that Lockville is one of the most popular destinations as well. Jim, you've got a question. Yeah, yeah, and sorry that that were these last couple of points they kind of made made mind that Lockvale is a high high use area, and it would be and um, and so other high use areas may be experiencing such uh, contributions from humans. Uh, but by and large, say in the just to acknowledge the you know the Alpine tundra, which one of the reasons the park was established and this project is designed to to protect, is not is unlikely to be experiencing those contributions to that level from humans. 
I, I don't disagree, Jim, but we did have trail counters going all the way up to Sky Pond and I have pictures. Um, access to alpine areas has increased exponentially and we were finding caffeine um, in those soils as well. So you're right, not every part of the park, but when Laura Scott did her studies, even on mountaintops, she was finding evidence of, of human products. Thank you. Yeah, that was, that's that's um, interesting to hear. Thank you. Matt. I, uh, I was just wondering if it could the 2% number be slightly underestimated if you were using caffeine as like a, a tracer, you know, if, if someone didn't drink caffeine or something like that. Yeah, you know, it's like, what, the number, the 2% is a potential. So it's the maximum amount you could expect from human urine. We, um, we, we made all kinds of assumptions. They're described in the paper. Um, and, and we basically assumed everyone up there was caffeinated to the gills. So whether that's true or not, I don't know. But it's, it, it's a high number. Um, it's probably somewhere in between, maybe a little bit lower. Um, yeah, I, I, small children go up there all the time. And of course, they're the least likely to be able to, to um, hold it until they get back down. It's a five mile trek, even to the outlet of the lock. So they may not be contributing. Um, our number is a potential. It's the highest potential number amount that you could get contributed if everyone was drinking Coke or coffee and then going up there and doing their business. And there are no pit toilets up there, so they do it wherever. And we mapped that, which was an interesting exercise. I, I will say that I am taking um, a reporter. He's a senior journalist for the NPCA magazine. His name is Nicolas Brouillard. I'm taking him up on May 30th and we'll be talking about this topic. Perfect. That's a great story. Thanks for the work and sharing it here today. It's, My uh, pleasure. it's nice. People get a chance to realize there's many possible com uh, contributions. Great. All right. Um, let's keep moving. We've got a lot to cover still. Uh, Emily, are you there? We want to give us an update on uh, the Trans2M? Sure. Can I share my screen? Yes, please do. I think, um, I think, okay, hang on. It's not letting me. Let me try again. Oh, there we go. All right. Can you see that now? Yes. All right. So um, I'll try to keep this brief. So we have a little bit of time for Q&A. The last time I spoke to you was in November. Today, I'm joined by my graduate student, Julieta who has done um, most of this work. So as a reminder, we held two different um, aircraft campaigns. One occurred in August, 2021, and the second one in August, 2022. Last time I showed you data from flux estimates from individual facilities, only from the 2021 campaign. That paper, Julieta submitted it maybe two weeks ago. <laughs> so that paper, um, is now under review at JGR. And today I'm going to show you the data from the other types of flights that we did, which were um, focused on easterly wind conditions on sort of gentle summertime upslope days. So um, on the left here, we have our flight path and we repeated this flight path each time there were um, easterly wind conditions. And so there's, these are flight legs. We went down at a low altitude, return north at a higher altitude. So 500 feet AGL on the way down um, to a thousand feet back. And then um, we would repeat that here, here. And then our final most westerly leg um, was nearly right over Estes Park. And so on one of the days, we were also able to coordinate that with a, a Tahoe, with a Ammonia Picaro uh, in the back of the vehicle. And so these are also, this line also here is covered by ammonia. We were able to drive up um, down behind Devil's Backbone, uh, down to Carter Lake, and then Julieta came back. So this is what you'll be looking at, these kinds of flights. So here's just a, another view. Here's a longitude altitude view. Here's our legs that we did with the aircraft, leg one, leg two, leg three, leg four. 
Um, we were often only able to do over the mountains at the lowest altitude possible one leg. Um, and then the green dots here uh, give you a sense of the number of facilities between the different legs. So the most um, number of facilities are, are located in here between these two legs. So big takeaways for you all, there's usually two orders of magnitude less ammonium than ammonia. So it's mostly in the gas phase. And you can see here going from um, east to west, there's a pretty um, substantial drop off. And we'll show you this um, in a minute here in gas phase ammonia, which are the solid boxes as you go from the east to the west. So here's an example of a specific day. This is the first event like this that we did that we sampled in July 2021. Um, and I'll walk you through this one a little bit slower. And I'm going to show you what the winds look like. The winds that I, I will start popping in here are from the aircraft measurements on each leg. So furthest to the east, the winds had a southerly component. And what Julieta has done here is for to help your eye is put um, forward trajectories. That's what the black lines are. And each dot is an hour in time. So one, two, three, four, five, six hour trajectories here. So you can see that on this leg, the air was moving to the north. Um, and then as we move further in, the um, wind has more of a southeasterly component and the trajectories show that the air that we would have sampled here was moving in this direction. As we move even further in from the last one, so if I go back, can also see the wind speeds come up a little bit. Um, and as we get, oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction, this way. As we get here, yep, we have more of an easterly component to the winds. And um, this blob was likely sampled again here over the mountains. And so these enhancements um, were, were pretty much able with the aircraft on some conditions to sample a discrete plume. It is quite possible that this plume here is associated with here, which is the um, large facility that's right in this area. And this enhancement over the mountains here is somewhere between five and 10 uh, PPB. And that occurs about four hours downwind from here. That's about a four hour transit time to get something from this line here and to here in summer. So what Julieta did next was calculate some fluxes. And so it's using a mass balance approach and some assumptions. She used the aircraft data, whoops, used the aircraft data um, to make some curtains. And so here we're going from the east, going um, to the west, and we forgot to move these numbers around. We just switched it. We, <laughs> we switched it to make it east to west and we didn't move the numbers. But as you go from as you go from um, here to here, you're losing about um, between 75% or two thirds in that range of the ammonia from one curtain to the next. And then you have a similar scale loss over to this curtain. So this the amount of ammonia basically passing on at what we threw that leg over Estes Park under this day is about 5% of the ammonia that was passing through the leg um right downwind of Greeley essentially so so that's what we're starting to be able to estimate with these flights so I'll show you one more example of this so each of these events just to remind you and you know for us when Russ pops on he can give you a master class and how this works right but um but we're are thinking about this um, and trying to just um, get the anatomy of these summertime events better. And so here's a just a, an image to keep in your mind. There's this easterly flow. And there, um, what we're not sure about is how far this extends east. And we're, what we're also able to see in some of our, our events here is this is a bit of a return happening with the air. So let me show you another example there. Um, so here's an example from August 16th. So same, we have the winds, you know, the wind roses. This furthest leg here out to the east has very weak winds and all over the place winds. 
<laughs> so it's not strictly easterly, it seems, in these summertime events that we were able to capture fully out here. The transport seems to be much more efficient coming from approximately this line inward. Um, and you can kind of see that in the winds. This is the wind rows associated with the um, easternmost leg. And then you see this one has a little bit of a southerly component, but also some other, uh, sorry, uh, southeasterly winds, which you can see in the trajectories here. Then you're more fully developed with a stronger easterly component as you move toward the mountains. So, and you can also see these trajectories right from here. This is a forward trajectory from the plumes here. They're showing the air coming in and then moving out. So Julieta is doing these flux calculations with these different um, walls that we've created with the aircraft. This is a, the same thing another day, just a, a slightly different, slightly um, weaker winds and that little bit of the return flow. And again, between that leg that's um, just west of Greeley, imagine that's 100%. Then you go um, to this one is about 45% of that and then down to about 15% of that leg. So um, that's what we've been working on here is trying to quantify that. She's doing an, um, a visit at NCAR for the next two months and we'll try to uh, do some chemical transport modeling of these specific six events that we've captured. And so things that we're working on are an analysis of the wind evolution in nearby areas on these specific days to see if we can confirm ah, on these types of days, the ammonia is not really coming from behind Greeley or east of Greeley because the winds are too weak. Where, where actually could we be transporting in this sort of six hour time frame? Where could we actually be moving the ammonia in from? And she's working on the chemical transport modeling of specific events. The paper um, describing emissions from individual facilities based on the 2021 data is now under review at JGR. I'm happy to share that with anybody who's interested. And we have another student in the department who's working on some thermodynamic modeling to see if we can understand um, and predict the gas aerosol partitioning better. So that's all I wanted to share with you. I wanted to leave if we have a minute or two um, left for questions. Let me just stop sharing here. Where's my bar? <laughs> it is. I'm sorry, I couldn't see your faces. Now I can see your faces again. Okay, question. Do you mind continuing to share? So we oh, can sure, can... sorry. Sorry, let me just share and be able to see you at the same time. <laughs> Trust me, you'd rather look at your presentation. Okay. Yeah, just go ahead and ask your question why. Where did it go? Well, it, it was relative to a couple of your si slides showing uh, flight patterns and then. Oh. Uh, okay, hang on. My computer's just doing something weird. I'm I'm working on it. All right, uh, go. Got it. Which? Okay, start up there about six. I'm not sure which one it was. Okay, uh, just scroll down through them and I'll tell you where to stop. Oh. Okay, that one right there. Um, you know, it shows a pattern. You were saying, I think on the next slide, it actually shows that area from, there you go. You were mm -hmm. saying the area that it's showing going into the park from west of Loveland, Fort Collins, likely came from the facility to the southeast. If you click back one slide, that was on the very southern end of, of what their wind projections were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, so the trajectories, um, we are just... The trajectories here, we're trying to figure out how to display this the best without having a trajectory at every sample. She's right. basically put the trajectories on ammonia hotspots in the aircraft measurements going down the line. There's very different amounts of ammonia in each of these um, samples here. So, um, and the trajectories, right, are often have some uncertainty associated with them. Right. So this plume is from somewhere in here. It's well, from it, somewhere in there. As you continue down in your slide deck, that, that same area, you can keep going from there, west of Fort Collins and Loveland, continues yep. to show up on later slides as well. Have we explored, is there, are there any wastewater treatment plants, anything like that up along the western side of those cities that could also be contributing factors to that that kind of pinkish area, or 
are we assuming it has to be transport from the that is it, being? It, I think it's transport from that direction. Um, and but you know what's really also interesting? I don't know if it shows it very well here. You can also see when you drive the the stuff on the ground when Julieta was driving on the ground. It's almost like we could see with the vehicle, it also channeling up through 34 and Devil's Backbone. Like, so there's some kind of channeling happening that we were able to capture both, I think, with the plane and that level of flow is not going to be captured by the trajectory. So, so yeah, we can look into it and double check that area, but right now it, this, the plume, we don't have this so easy to see right now um, right. because the scale's kind of maxed out here. But there, this area right here is very high in this leg, is very, is the highest piece of that leg. And it's not the same every time. This was, if you look in this, uh, this one here, this one, we don't see a really clear plume. This we have examples where there's a big wide plume of ammonia, and we have examples where there's a really narrow one. And so this one that I'm showing you is an example of a more narrow, a more narrow one. Right. I just I just noticed that 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 one location kind of west of Loveland, Fort Collins, continues mm -hmm. to show up. And yeah, there could be some contribution from this facility here, or in these okay. facilities here. Are these only animal facilities, or do you also have oil and gas facilities? Is this what all is is shown on your? Here, I'll go back to the dots here, the colors here. So, um, cattle is so it's blue. all animal. It's all animal. Cattle is blue. Chicken is irrelevant, probably. Dairy is is um, pink. Okay. And and I'm assuming these are based on permitted capacities, not necessarily. They are. Yep. It's just the CDPG max animal capacity that's plotted right. there from 20 and old from 2015. 2015. Yeah. Would it be possible to drop any um metro? I mean, the one thing that comes to mind is wastewater um treatment yeah. facilities. Would it be possible to drop those on these and just share that sure. back out? Just sure. Just curious. Yeah, do you, we have data, I, I, we I have would, this, do, or do we, did I we, have data we have for landfills, land deals, but yeah. I would have to get the data for water waste. Yeah, we did, do, is that a data set that someone has with lat longs? That would be amazing. Otherwise, we're going to have to make that. We're, we have landfills already, though. Yeah, re reach out to me. Um, I'll Ooh. drop my email in the chat and I can work Thanks, with Josh. our water and our waste group. That would be awesome if we could Thank you. have that without having to find it ourselves. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I mean, I think adding those in landfills both makes sense and maybe some oil and gas facilities just to get a whole picture. I know this is the Ag subcommittee, but more data points is good. I, I appreciate you answering all my questions. Thank you. Of course, no problem. Um, I don't know whose hand was up next, so maybe it was Bonnie. Bonnie, Bonnie next, Julie. And, then, uh, and then Julie, yeah. Uh, just, this looks like a tremendous amount of work. Uh, so kudos to your, to your grad student. Um, I know that our goal was to capture upslope events, and it sounds like we did that. Um, I was curious, do we have anything uh, where the winds are going the other direction? And I guess I was, my thought being that if there is that metropolitan influence, you might see it potentially going the other way. And like I said, I know the goal for this was really trying to get those upslope events, um, but was just curious if you guys had, if we have anything where the winds go in the other way. Well, we have tons of transits with the winds going the other way, but not these legs. So okay. um, we we often were transiting from Laramie to somewhere around Greeley or south of Greeley under northerly westerly wind directions. So we could separate all the data by those wind directions and look at something like that. I'm just thinking about how we would do it, but I think we could do something kind of like that. Take the full data set separate by something with a westerly component and then create some kind of spatial distribution that that's something we should be able to do and, yeah. and maybe it doesn't look like anything i was just curious because you know we've heard a few things about you know uh, vehicles potentially putting out a little more ammonia than previously thought might be one way to to parse out if there is that influence there but also maybe not but um so i appreciate yeah, we, we don't see a strong relationship with ammonia and co in our data set okay. so that's one piece of information, but the 20, but 
but I'm giving you that answer from the 2021 data set, which had a heavy fire influence. So we should recheck that with the 2022 data set. So, but that's not a big pattern in the data. Is, is so that, what would that mean? I guess I'm not. Oh, I'm so not. vehicles would also emit CO, right? Okay. So we don't yeah. see a strong, there's not a strong mm -hmm. ammonia CO relationship. So there's no, in any of the analysis we've done, like she's tried to pick out urban areas already in our transects and, um, the plumes are very, very narrow and, and you don't really see them downwind. So they are very localized to big highways um, and um, yeah, and, and you don't see them downwind if, if we were to sample downwind of those. Yeah, we're not able to like repeat it. We don't see like repeatedly sampling that they're not big in that way. So, um, but we can, we, that is based on 2021 data that mm -hmm. We haven't, we kind of switched after 2021 to look at these based also based on your interest to like look at this next. Um, and, and so that you looked at one that had a fire heavy year and yeah. now that has less of that influence yeah. and that might yeah. affect change if you think, okay. If, if there is a signal, it might be easier to pull out a 2022 than 2021 because the fire plumes will bring us another 100 PPB of CO that we're okay. that is clouding things. <laughs> so it also, they also bring some ammonia too, but these plumes are very easy to pick out even in that because that's so well mixed. Yeah. Those fire plumes are so well mixed. Um, uh, jo oh, sorry, Julie. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's down at slide 14 or so. I, um, next, yeah, there. So if I'm reading this correctly, the very far slide on the right. Um, we made, some here, it should be like this, hang on. We did something, we moved it to be west to east at the very last minute, <laughs> okay. and it should be this. I just, we forgot to change the numbers because I came from another meeting. Okay, so 100% is here on leg, on leg uh, west of Greeley. Mm -hmm. And if you add up the ammonia passing through a similar box closer to the mountains, it's 45% of what passed through this box. And if you assume this is 100%, by the time you get over to the box over Estes Park, it's 15% of this, of that wall. Okay. That's the what approximate ammonia about, being lost. Okay. What I wanted to ask you, though, was about the very far right box. So to me, that's showing there is some influence. There is, and you're at 1900 and then you're at 3827. So is that a cumulative total? Uh, you can't think of it that way because look over here, mm -hmm. these, these, the winds are very weak on this particular case study and in six hours, it's not making it from here to here. Okay. It's moved, that air is moving okay. to the north. Yeah. Okay. It, and almost nowhere. It's kind of okay. like, that, 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 that was where yeah. I was trying to yeah. see and, that's a cumulative total from something further to the east. But if it's not making it clear to the west, yeah, I mean, it. The only way you can think about this is that's what's passing through that line. It could have come from anywhere, mm -hmm. right? But it's that's the flux through that wall. Let's say that wall that we've made with the aircraft just west of Greeley. So it could have come from upwind, but it, in this particular day, that doesn't make sense. Right. Like because this, these winds are very weak out here, and things are not really moving. Okay, Which you. this we didn't know. We didn't anticipate this. Often, you know, in retrospect, perhaps I should not have flown this line consistently because most of our days, it seems like they're very weak winds over here. And but there's really not good wind data over here either. If you there's a there's a site in Greeley at the airport and there's no wind data over here. So I, so we had really no way to know what the winds would be when we got here from Laramie until we actually went there. So mm -hmm. we repeatedly flew that line. Now I know winds there are quite weak, but I don't think we knew that without the aircraft data. So Josh, what did you have? Yeah, really just a, a quick comment. And then I do need to drop off here for another meeting. But you mentioned kind of uh, thinking about how to display this data in the in the forward cast. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if there's a way to kind of combine what you have on slides 13 and 14. And instead of having dots for your forward cast, display it as some type some type of a, a gradient line with the with the color coding similar to what you're doing you know with your flight path lines I don't know that you could probably display it on the same slide because I think it would get really busy and really hard to understand but 
you know, I wonder if a, a gradient line and, and even if you can go further than six hours to, to 12 or 18 hours um, might really help to visually understand this data a little bit better. Yeah, we can. She's run some longer trajectories, but um, this is the time scale of which the plane was in the air, right? Yeah. So we don't have a way to, <laughs> to, we could do that to visualize it, but but we won't, we don't have any in situ measurements passed really, right? These are. No, I think this is the, the most critical, the, the short time scale to understand how things are moving in, in, in the near term. Um, and, and, you know, I think this, this is amazing work. I'm, I'm really mm -hmm. interested to see where, where it goes and kind of what the final paper looks like, but, um, I, I would not have either kind of guessed that some of those, those further East sites may have a very minimal impact on what we're seeing in the park. And on a warm summer, yeah. August day, these yeah. are weak winds, right? Like, yeah. so I, this, we have to be careful not very to caveated. I understand extrapolate <laughs> this to the, you know, and I wanted this field campaign to cover the April, May, and then the September, October, but that's how it was originally proposed, then got moved with COVID, then the plane broke. But so yeah. we have two August, <laughs> so we have these weak, this is what, a, you know, these weak summer winds look like. Yeah. So yeah, Brett, thank I, you, Josh. Oh, can I just thank you so much. I, the other thing is that we uh, sampled that first leg early in the morning because we were trying to get there to avoid uh, storms. And so <laughs> what I am looking into now is um, what those winds looked after in the in later in the afternoon and see if they evolved to be a stronger easterly winds. Yeah. Um, so yeah. We're, we're figuring out the winds next because it turns, I think this is the next most important thing to figure out. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so we should have that pretty soon too. So uh, really interesting. Thank you all. Thank Let's you. Let's get uh, one more question then we need to move on. Yeah. Bit, so. uh, th thanks, Emily. I, I just wanted to uh, a couple comments. One is that we do know that the Front Range Longmont to Fort Collins, because of human activity and everything else, does have about, I don't know, three or four ppb of ammonia uh, in it. And so when this is transporting into the mountains, it's going to add to it. but if I'm reading your things right, these plumes as you're hitting the mountains, they're 10, 15, 20 ppb. So you're well above the background that we would see from um, emissions within that Fort Collins Longmont area. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, especially on this line, right. this line right. is much higher, right? This plume was seven. 7 ppb ish mm -hmm. when we, you know, come from outside right. and into it. But this is much. This is a much larger enhancement than a couple right. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, so I'm trying to uh, respond a little bit to Justin's question, which 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 is good. Um, another thing is that you mentioned that you're you could be seeing some channeling of this stuff up the the what the 34 Valley. And yeah. I, I suspect you're right. And uh, you know the, the the committee here actually funded Jeff to do some continuous measurements uh, right around there. And we didn't see any evidence of, um, of uh, elevated um, plumes coming in over short periods of time. So if it is doing it, and I suspect it is, it's probably elevated a little bit. Um, well, we found it with the Tahoe, but only we only had the Tahoe a few times and because yeah. that Picaro was behaving terribly. So, but it's elevated. You can find it at the ground here. So it's, but I don't know how far it goes up in here. Like that's no. the, like, we have no idea. We don't. We don't know that. In well, retrospect, I, I would have put. I would say we have a data this. set that's probably worth looking at. And might okay. shed some light on on some of the, these things. And, and and a quick question for you: uh, You talked about a Lagrangian experiment, and you you have the winds. So do you feel like that when the plane was going doing the cross section, you had had enough time for transport from the the east to that um, cross section? Could you be ahead of it? Could no, you be behind no. it? We are probably we are not doing it in a pseudo Lagrangian way. Sometimes we are within thirty minutes, probably, okay. but we're but thirty to forty five minutes. But it depends on the wind speeds, and the wind speeds are actually quite variable between the different ones. So we haven't tried to figure that out yet. How close we got? Yeah, um, that would be an interesting calculation because since you are starting in the morning, you could be ahead of that plume. Correct, and what that would mean is we are not. We're actually um, under 
right. estimating how much is making it there. So, exactly. so, and, and so one slide I had, and I know we have to go, Brett, but I can send this to you and I can talk about it in a week or so, huh. is we've looked really carefully at time of day for our fluxes. And so we're trying to think, and which there's a clear increase in the ammonia to methane ratio in the afternoons. Um, and so we're trying to figure out if we would be under or overestimating this based on this time of day issue. So that is something we'll try to have some insight into soon. Terrific. Um, and, and understanding those loss mechanisms those, um, it, as it transports west would be fascinating. Is it deposition? Is it dilution? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank thanks. You. Thank, yeah, you. thank you so much, Dr. Fisher. Really great work there. And uh, tell your team, uh, everyone involved, uh, there's a lot of interest. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, <okay. laughs> She's doing a lot. Yes, she's um, awesome. Thank uh, you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, we, I've been just seeing a lot of traffic. Everybody wants to have a, a copy of this presentation or a link to this. Can you share that either yep, with me sure. directly? I'm going to a field site like three minutes ago and then I yep. will do it later. Okay, yeah, bye. You can email it to me and we'll attach it to the notes when those go out next week for everybody. Uh, thank you for everything. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. All right. Excellent work. Yeah. All right. Um, here we go. Brian, can you also make sure to get that preliminary paper that she mentioned? Yes. 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 I'll, not just the presentation, but the paper. Oh, not just. Know. Yes. Thank you. I'll make okay. that note. Perfect. All right. Well, we're a little long, but there was a lot of interest there. And that's some of the best visualized uh, data we've seen in a while. So appreciate everyone um, just holding, uh, holding back here a little bit. Bonnie, let's go ahead and jump into our last uh, exercise here. I don't see Russ on the line, so maybe we'll just get him next time and we can use the rest of our time for uh, BMP. Um, do you want me to pull up the... Yeah, please. We've got for... Okay, give me just one second. Okay. Hopefully, is it legible for you guys? Are you able to? Yep. To read it's it. A little, a little small, but we need to see the the scale here. I think so. Okay. I'll uh, I'll let others comment if they need uh, eyeglasses. <laughs> and well, and it's a lot of information um, to try to wrangle. So we'll start off at the kind of the top. We've got our goal with this, um, and a lot of this was borrowed from our um, guiding principles. That's where this language came from. Um, would love to get folks feedback on that in terms of what they see um, as the goal of this. And so we we meet as this kind of a side BMP group to really get into the nitty gritty on best management practices um, because it can be a very technical discussion um, and is you know it's it's a lot to get your arms around. Um, so we've got our goal and our objective from our guiding principles, and then we've broken the BMPs kind of down into two categories, and that's your year round um, best management practices that folks are doing you know, 24-7, 365, um, BMPs that we included in our uh, survey and um, a document that this group developed in 2018 were, is what we started off with, that's what we included. Um, and then uh, we also have early warning system BMPs and that's taken from um, their, what actually gets sent out uh, in the BMP to producers um, when we have those upslope events. So, We've also got a couple different categories that we're trying to break it down into. Uh, it's one of those things where you can kind of get into the weeds, um, trying to break things down, but it's animal health and nutrition, manure and effluent management, um, and then early warning system, animal production and crop production, um, and then goes from there. So we've got our list of BMPs here, uh, the sector in terms of where there's a difference between uh, beef, dairy, and swine. Uh, whether it's being implemented year round or if it's a practice that could also be utilized or should specifically be utilized during the early warning system updates. Um, we've got the category that it falls into. We have been a while back, we also paired um, NRCS practice codes with it just for kind of future reference for being able to sometimes pull NRCS information on the number of producers they've got to um, use those and those NRCS practice codes. So if there's a practice code available, we've got that there. Um, the 
kind of categories we're looking at for HBMP or the questions we would hopefully like to be able to answer is maybe being able to give it an efficacy rating um, in terms of improvement, um, how it could potentially impact ammonia emissions. Um, how feasible is it? Is this something that's only been demonstrated at the lab scale? Is this something that we've seen at a field scale? Um, and kind of doing a generic, um, I, I, I threw in a very generic scale there for the group's discussion. This is not something that the group has settled on, but just based on uh, conversations that we've had and then um, trying to look at cost and in our discussions, cost is a very complex um, topic and it really depends on how you slice it. So at least right now, I think we're thinking kind of a very generic, is, is there probably no cost limit? Is it way too cost prohibitive? Um, and again, these scales are open for discussion. Um, and then uh, we also um, have a category for also per, uh, potential perverse consequences. And then in all of this, um, for each BMP, if we have uh, literature sources, if we have peer reviewed literature sources, we're kind of trying to summarize those here, where we would just make a note of it and then have those additional resources available. So that's kind of the general structure as we have it right now. And if yeah, anybody wants to have a really good time and you really want to dig into this list, I would invite you to come to the BMP work group meetings. We'd love to have yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll make a, an appeal for that at the end, Bonnie, but you're right. Um, we, we are looking for folks to want to help us contribute work the, uh, the, through the work here. So. Brian, Brian can, can I have a question? question? Please. Um, Bonnie, uh, this, this is uh, really, really great. Um, I think, I think no, I wouldn't say similar, similar because I don't know the details for this, this but EPA has one uh, load reduction uh, model itself. And, and I wonder how compatible, how different this is from it. Um, I think EPA also includes like other EMPs than only um, uh, animal uh, EMPs. So, so uh, uh, have, have you guys, guys looked at it? it? Not to my knowledge. So, and I'm sorry, can I, there was a little bit of feedback. I missed what you said that the APA has a tool. Yeah, yeah EPA, EPA has a um, load, load reduction, reduction tool. tool. Um, it, it is a little, little bit larger, larger than this um, because, because it, it also includes other BMPs other, other than animals. animals. So, so um, but it, it has an animal part of it. Uh, that's, that's why I was um, kind of wondering if it, it is uh, um, like, like compatible, compatible with that, that or is this is totally different? different. So I don't think we've looked at it recently. If you could send it to me, that would be great. Uh, I have a feeling that it might be something that the group looked at when they first, like way back in the day when these lists were kind of first developed, but maybe not. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I've seen it recently. So if you could email that to me, that would be great. It, it doesn't ring a bell for me. Um, Julie? I do think that when we originally looked at this, I mean, talking years ago, we looked at what EPA was coming out with not necessarily their tool, but some information. But most of this is based on NRCS, hence why we have NRCS practice codes. Right. Other initial thoughts for Bonnie? Hey, Brian, this is this is Jim. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Um, yeah, um, this was uh, just a briefly, I mean, this is what I was reflecting on when I, when I said early on that, you know, we've sort of been the most organized and proactive and uh, on the, on the BM free, BMP front, I, I think, since the since the very beginning. So, I mean, kudos to uh, ongoing kudos to Bonnie and group and develop and refining this. I mean, what, what are the, one of the um, what I recall, like a comment from last time, I'm, I'm looking at the versions from last time and this time, last time there was like only the early warning system BMPs for crop production, but I do see a specific crop production category in there for probably um, uh, what early what early warning system. Well, there are, there's two early warning system and also just for crop production in general. So thank you for, um, it appears that that's been um, considered and included. So uh, appreciate that. 
I, I do have the I have the PDF version of of this. Uh, um, is, is it possible to get the the Excel version as well, or has that been sent out? Sorry if I missed. No, it hasn't, and I guess partly just because the intention is that we work on that as a group together. So yeah. okay, the PDF PDF out for for review, but no, we didn't share it. I mean, we can if that's what folks would like to do, but just don't would, too far ahead of ourselves because I think the agreement there at that group was that anything we wanted to add or subtract should be discussed. Yeah, Bonnie, I just wanted to make a, a, a statement around that. We had agreed as a group uh, that we didn't want people to uh, to have multiple versions of this out there with different estimates in terms of what some of this, this fact is. Um, so as we work through um, adding information to this, we want to kind of build up a, a common truth and then we can share out, share out that information in a PDF format so that it doesn't get um, changed by some, by one party and seeming to represent the group. Um, I think that will keep folks um, clear as to what the group's consensus is and that's going to be our model to move forward. And um, so it, it slows us down a little bit in terms of what you know might happen, but it'll keep us on one clear path in terms of what the group's truth is. And that's really what's important. And so we're, uh, we're committed to that. And uh, Justin, I see you got a hand up. I just wanted to tell <clears throat> Bonnie, thank you for putting this together. I know this is taking a ton of time to get it organized and, and uh, reassembled where it's, it's in a usable document. And I appreciate that. I also just wanted to toss out, <clears throat> Bonnie, if you'll scroll over to the right just a little bit, I think the the biggest challenges with this it process is, and I just, I want to throw this out uh, right now, is, is that feasibility, scalability, and cost. Uh, just because facilities are so different. A feed yard is a feed yard is a feed yard in most ways, but scale a feed yard, what one producer can do, what another producer can't. Uh, just infrastructure, um, underlying infrastructures that one facility may have and one facility doesn't, can be incredibly hampering or favorable towards one BMP or another. And I know it applies in the dairy and the hog and, and, and even in the farming side. So this one is those two categories, the feasibility, scalability, and cost, especially cost, are, are the two that, that give me the most... Um, concern that I just want us to be careful with. I don't want mm -hmm. us to create a document that says, hey, this is easy and it's cheap. And it may be easy and cheap for me, but it may be really expensive and really hard for somebody else. And I, I know we've talked about this many times, but th that's, I, I don't want this group to become some something that creates a document that says thou shalt go do this because it's cheap and easy because one size doesn't fit all and that's really been the beauty of this group and everything we've tried to achieve through the years is is creating a suite of BMPs that producers can use that fit their operation depending on on their challenges or or whatever their how their operation is ran so thank you Bonnie for doing this I think this is very well put together and very well organized and I look forward to seeing what what we can accomplish through this BMP process. Yeah, amen, Justin, to that. Um, and just wanted to add a little bit. I, I think part of it is we really don't want this getting taken out of context. This is right now, I think, at least the way I see it, um, is an attempt to distill what this group has been working on for a very long time and that it turns out that there's not an easy, straightforward answer to here's the list, here's what it does, here's who's doing it. If that list could have been put together, we would have done it a decade ago. Um, so we're also trying to just document the complexity in how these BMPs work and under what scenarios. Um, so also trying to get that pulled in um, as uh, to just kind of really show how complex the situation is. So, um, it, you know, it's kind of for a specific purpose and I just don't want it to turn into something else. Yes. Yeah, and just to voice that relationship stepwise is like this is the this is essentially the you know developing refining continual development of of what should be done uh, to inform the um, you know with, with with caveats to inform the surveys uh, to collect you know kind of what what is being done within within the focus area to then understand whether or not BMPs are being optimized. Yes. 
So Bonnie, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take a frame in terms of how we wanna proceed on this and feel free to, to put a little more color on it. But, but my goal here would be to work with Bonnie. Um, we've got this draft now, we're, we're, we've been working on the structure obviously of this to get this in a place where we can start to populate it. And that's really where we go from here. So um, as we convene our next BMP working group meeting and I'll, and I'll work to schedule that here in the next week or two um, and get that on the calendar. But as we meet in that setting, of course, our goal is going to be, all right, well, what do we know uh, in terms of efficacy to start with, for example, um, what, where, where has there been research? Try to put, put the, uh, you know, the filler into these cells now that we've got the, the rows and columns established. And then uh, working in a way to keep this readable, uh, we'll probably have links or other tools within the uh, the cells there that will push push you back to other material, maybe on other sheets or other documents, uh, so that folks can scan this and use this as a bit of a, a dashboard to see where are we overall. We don't want to weigh this down with um, you know paragraphs of information in these cells. That, that those will link out from here, and um, and then we'll continue to work through it as a draft um, and allow ourselves to uh, to you know, make sure the working group is comfortable with that. And then we can share this out with, with probably a draft watermark, you know, as we work through uh, everything moving forward. Bonnie, is that fair? Uh, I, I think so. And I think it will also help us highlight and pinpoint what we don't know and where areas of research um, where there is a need. And so one of the things that has come up a few times um, is that what we might find out from this practice is that we need a lit review, that we need to invest in somebody who can answer these questions for us or tell us if this is out there. We know some as producers and we'll fill in gaps where we can. Um, but I think it's also going to really help us highlight uh, what we don't know in addition to what we do know, uh, which is good and uh, really helps us kind of target target research dollars and efforts and that kind of thing. So I just wanted to include that component, you know, that we might come to find out that we still have quite a few unknowns here. Um, and then that's where we maybe need to uh, advance some more efforts. So. Perfect. All right. Um, well, we have one other uh, item I want to touch on before we let y'all go. Um, I am looking for additional topics for upcoming meetings. Uh, I wanted to share that uh, Dr. Stackhouse Lawson from CSU's Agnext group uh, has been doing some research around greenhouse gas and how ammonia uh, could be uh, could be influenced with that. So we've asked her to come and present some uh, some data on the August third meeting. And certainly, any of you who um, have been involved in this know, uh, you know, we'll probably try to get Russ back uh, and get an update on the early warning system and how's that going as well as um, any of the work that's been done to uh, uh, to get out there on the road show and make folks aware uh, of participating in the, in the survey. So we want to make sure we keep touching back to uh, to the work that's going on and uh, and offer you an opportunity to ask questions. But feel free to offer or suggest other topics or speakers. We, uh, we are pretty open forum at this point and uh, trying to accommodate uh, interesting and revolutionary research here. Jim, go ahead. I think so. So, you know, the next agency um, task is the is our milestone report um, after we uh, pivot after the uh, the addendum, uh, you know, and the, there's the reportable action in, uh, item in there that was uh, agreed upon called the level of implementation of Colorado agriculture BMPs in the focus area. And so just to ensure, um, you know, for for that to be a potential agenda item to for you know, who who should be work who should we work with to ensure the um, you know that, that we have um, data and uh, such to to populate that reportable item in the milestone report mm -hmm. um, is is one thing that I have in mind is for the, is something we should um, you know look at for the near future here. Is that something you want to address before the next quarterly? Uh, I I think. Um, I think let's just let, let's just have it on on the next quarterly uh, okay. agenda is, is is my suggestion. I need to uh, circle back with the agencies after we pivot from the from the addendum. But I might even have something. Do do we have a BNP work group? Yeah, uh, that's what. Well, that's what I was going to suggest. I don't have it scheduled yet, right? But that's going to okay. come in about six weeks. We've been trying to split the quarterlies with the BMPs. Remember? Yep. Um, so in six weeks or so, 
we will have a BNP. I'd be willing to to offer you know a discussion of okay, what could we from the BNP group uh, be willing to target, for example, as a possible share for that report? Uh, exactly. That might be helpful. I Let's. I think the smaller group discussion would help, and then we can, you know, kind of report out to the to at, at the next quarterly. Okay. On the, on the side yeah, that well. feels that feels right, and we can let everyone opine at that point. Yep. You know, their comfort level and caveats and and all of that, which of which there will be many. So, uh, so Jim, you're needing something a section for the milestone report. It, it's a well. So in in the addendum, the, the there's there's the five items, key items that were. Um, using for project evaluation, one of the, one is the is just is what I read, and it's it's essentially telling agriculture story. We just want to make sure that we're on we are um you know on task for for doing so well. Yeah. yeah. Is there a plan for who's developing or writing that section? So this is you said it's listed in the agenda that you shared with us today. Yes. Is the key yeah. thing that you're going to want to have for the milestone report? Correct, and, and there's no there's there's no specific plan, but that's that's the need to acknowledge to the pieces that need to come together for that. And yeah, what I think we, we could help the... use the time in the BMP to decide that or help make that plan, Bonnie, if, if you like. So uh, possibly, what is the timeline for milestone report and reviewing it and getting it written and 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 and? Megan still on the call. Yeah, I'm here um timeline we can share that it's there's multiple different phases of it i think right now where we were already starting to go through and assign different sections and make sure that you know the outline of the report is, is um set to move forward with and the sections have the correct assignations to them um but i think we've Kind of gotten sidelined with this addendum and, and putting most of our effort towards that so haven't reflected on on that or done any at least personally speaking haven't gotten into it and started writing the sections quite yet um i think you know if i can pull up the timeline here um hang on <clears throat> thank you megan i was forgetting the particulars I think early yeah, no, at the end of this calendar year. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, no, that was the goal is to have it um, go to public comment by the end of the year, I believe, and then be out um, and published early next year. I don't think we saw a need to wait until um, as late in 2024 as we have in for past milestone reports. Um, let's see, hang on. So finalization and public, so yeah, agency review, let's see. So basically the writing of the report through um, the summer is, is the timeline that we had together. And then agent going to agency review in quarter three of this year, um, releasing it to our key stakeholders in quarter three of this year, and then finalization and going through the public comment phase in quarter four with publication in January of 2024. So um, I think that we can still stick to that timeline, but it definitely um, is going to move pretty quickly. So this group should expect to see it in the third quarter when you release yep. it to stakeholders. Although it sounds like we'll probably need to be involved in developing it. Yeah. Correct. To, ins to ensure those the ag story is, is told accurately as committed to in the uh, in in the addendum, and you, you, you know the last milestone re re report uh, told agriculture story to a certain degree, but I think we've got more more and better information now, right? So uh, so we just want to uh, make sure that that is uh, you know primed to be um, inserted into the report. So uh, everybody, unfortunately, I do have a hard stop at one. I'm facilitating yeah. another working group yeah. <laughs> right at one. <laughs> Um, that is the way of the world now, it seems. So we will collect notes uh, from all of this. Uh, feel free to email me if you have anything else you'd want to be included in those notes. Um, I've asked for the report and the link. I've asked for the slides and I'll make sure I get the link to the actual underlying report that we saw from um, from Dr. Fisher and, and her team and, um, and anything else that you'd like to see. And we'll get those notes out here uh, as quick as possible once I get all the uh, the links and attachments and so on. 
thanks everyone for a great work today. Um, delighted to have all of you and uh, we'll continue with our next, uh, you should see some traffic from me from the notes and then uh, trying to schedule the next BMP. We'll get that on the, uh, on the calendar here in the next five to six weeks. Thanks everyone. Perfect. Thanks all.